Parkinson's disease, the second most common neurodegenerative disorder in society. It's generally found in the aging population. So people who are 55, 60 years of age, that's when most will be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And when they present to clinicians, very often they might have slight trembling or shaking. And it's a classical symptom of Parkinson's disease, loss of motor control or control over your muscle. So the motor neurons that extend out of the brain down to the muscle, they can no longer be controlled properly. So what we know in Parkinson's disease is that about 80% of a certain type of brain cell must be lost before the symptoms present. So the cells in the brain that make this chemical in the brain, it's called dopamine, are very, very important. And often dopamine we know to be involved in things like depression and mood disorder um, and in Parkinson's disease. So we don't know why the neurons, the dopamine producing neurons, die in Parkinson's disease, but when they do, you get catastrophic uh, outcomes. So it's one of the key research areas uh, for people like me, I'm a research scientist, a neuroscientist, trained as a biochemist, um, but specializing in, in mechanisms of neurodegeneration. So it's very important for me to try and find out why dopamine neurons die in the brain. What makes them in Parkinson patients susceptible to die before or in comparison to dopamine neurons in normal brains? In Trinity, what we've been doing for the last 10 years is looking at mechanisms by which dopamine neurons die off preferentially. And one of my main areas of research is looking at uh, an organelle inside dopamine cells in the brain. And these organelles are called mitochondria. Now mitochondria are amazing little things because they make all the energy required that neurons require. Not just in the brain, but all cell types and around the body need large amounts of energy in the form of a chemical called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Well, in the Parkinson brain, for some reason, the mitochondria seem to be affected severely. So they don't work as well in comparison to a normal brain. So we think that's one of the, the fundamental mechanisms that are involved in, in killing off these dopamine neurons inside Parkinson's patients. Now, the big question is why does that happen? What we've been doing so far is looking at post-mortem tissue. So we wait to receive postmortem tissue and then we study it so we can study the mitochondrial function in that postmortem tissue. So it has given us a lot, of, a lot of answers as to what might be going on in the Parkinson brain. But unfortunately, working with postmortem tissue is like visiting the crime scene after the crime has been committed. So ideally, what we would like to know is what happens when somebody's maybe 20 years of age or 30 years of age, what happens to the mitochondria inside the dopamine neurons in that person's brain? Is it abnormally affected in comparison to normal brains? Um, or is it, do, do, for some unknown reason, do, they, do people just lose function of the mitochondrial function and dopamine neuron function at a certain age in life? So that's a key question. Now, unfortunately, until now, we haven't had the tools. So it's very, we can't go into somebody's brain and take out samples and study them. So it's been obviously impossible to do that, but now, uh, there are new technologies that have emerged on the scene that have enabled us to generate in the laboratory tissue, real live tissue, um, from Parkinson's patients to do experiments on and to observe and to try and figure out why they're different. Stem cell biology has been around for quite a number of years, not that many researchers working on it, but recently it's exploded onto the world research scene. And it's mainly because of a group in Japan um, headed by a scientist called Yamanaka. And what these guys discovered was that it was possible to generate stem cells or things like st stem cells from patient tissue. Now, we know that stem cells, normal stem cells, they're very specialized cell types because they have the ability to change into any cell type in the body. We call them pluripotent stem cells. So it's very important in normal development, especially in normal development of the brain, because the brain is made up of many different types of cells. So originally they were all stem cells, and then as we developed, the stem cells developed into specialized neurons. So in the case of uh, my research interest, dopamine neurons, for example, in Parkinson's disease. So these were originally stem cells, but then they became dopamine neurons. So one of the things that people have been trying in the past is to transplant these stem cells into brains, into Parkinsonian brains, and hopefully that these stem cells change into uh, dopamine neurons. Now there's been limited success so far, but it's a, it's a 
a research area that a number of groups around the world are actively pursuing. Now, in our own case in Trinity, what we are very interested in is getting a model to do our experiments on. So it's, it's difficult to work with post-mortem tissue, so we need a cell culture model. And ideally, we'd like a cell culture model that comes from humans, that comes from Parkinson's patients. A group headed by a researcher called Yamanaka in Japan developed a method by, whereby they could take skin cells from a human and reprogram these skin cells by adding certain factors. So it was really quite amazing. And what they found was when these cells were reprogrammed, the cells reverted to a stem cell-like state. So we went from an, an adult skin cell back to a stem cell. So that's a huge advantage because now it's possible to do this process, carry out this process, and culture up large numbers of the stem cells. Now these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS technology. For me, it's a fantastic technique in which I can generate stem cells from patient tissue. And once I've got these stem cells, say from Parkinson's patients, I can now change them into dopamine neurons. And that's what we've been doing in the laboratory. In Trinity, we've been lucky that the Parkinson's Association of Ireland have been very helpful. The organisation is made up of members uh, who have Parkinson's disease. A lot of the, the members will be very knowledgeable of current research that's going on. So in our own lab, um, we've started to work with Parkinson patients in Ireland and to take skin cells from them and to make these induced pluripotent stem cells. Around the world, uh, in places like the United Kingdom and, and in America, they're ahead of the game uh, because they've been dealing with stem cells for many years. So they've set up legal framework uh, that enables the researchers to work with stem cells because there are ethical questions surrounding working with embryonic stem cells. In this case, we're working with induced pluripotent stem cells, which are not embryonic. Uh, they're similar to embryonic stem cells, but they're, they're not derived from the embryo. Nevertheless, in Ireland, uh, there is no uh, legal framework that covers my, people like myself, researchers like myself, doing experiments with stem cells. What we're seeing more of now is that young Irish researchers are leaving the country to work in research groups, stem cell research groups around the world. It's a big problem for us because me especially, I want the best Irish researchers to do the best Irish research uh, in Trinity where, where we're based. If they're leaving because they can't do the key experiments, it's a major problem. So it's great that organisations like the Irish Stem Cell Foundation are actively encouraging the government uh, to produce uh, a legal framework to allow researchers like myself uh, to do stem cell biology work in Ireland, but also to allow patient groups to interact with people like me who want to do research uh, involving stem cells. Ultimately, it's the patient that we're working for.